So the format of the seminar will be that we're going to have a 25 to 30 minute presentation. Um, and then after that, there will be sort of 10 minutes to 15 minutes of discussion where we can take questions. Um, you can use your microphone or I'll read out questions if you want to just put them in the chat. Um, and then at the end, uh, there's some time for a catch up, which is not recorded. So with that, I want to introduce Brendan Riley. Um, he's going to be giving a talk on a high resolution record of inflammation and declination from the North Atlantic. Um, and with that, I think I can hand over to Brendan. Great. Thanks, other Brendan. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so thanks to the Magnets organizers for inviting me um, to speak today to all of you. Um, and also, you know, thanks for all that you do and keeping this seminar going for as long as you have. Uh, it's been a really nice thing. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Brendan Riley. I'm a research professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in New York. Um, but this project was a project that I started a few years ago uh, during my first postdoc with Joe Stoner at Oregon State University. Um, and it's exploring paleomaniac secular variation in the North Atlantic. Um, and so the, the motivating question for this, um, this project isn't necessarily a new one. I think it's something that a lot of people that are here have probably um, thought quite a bit about over the years. And it's, it's really, you know, what is the full amplitude and frequency characteristics of the geomagnetic field? Um, and do sediment archives, sediment paleomagnetic archives ever capture that variation? And so to do so, um, this study is focusing on a network of cores that were collected uh, from the marine Dufresne um, using their giant Calypso core system, so a really long uh, core system from the North Iceland continental shelf uh, and the Southeast Greenland continental shelf. Um, and so the beauty of these cores is that they're long and they're really high resolution um, and there are a lot of them and you can date them with radio carbon. Um, so I, again, you know, something that probably a lot of us are very familiar with and, and think about all the time is that the very nature of paleomagnetism is that the geologic materials that we use are, are not perfect recorders of the ancient geomagnetic field. And every type of archive has specific advantages and disadvantages to them. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that I, I really like about sedimentary archives of the geomagnetic field is that they can be continuous records and they can span many different time intervals. Um, they're distributed all over the earth. Uh, they could be co-registered with climate and environmental information. And so therefore, paleomagnetism is hugely important for understanding timescales and stratigraphic correlation. Um, and full vector reconstructions are possible, um, if not sometimes a little complex. And you know, to show that complexity, I, I put up these CT scans or X-ray images of, of some of the, my favorite sediment cores that I've worked on over the years that I think are really quite beautiful. Um, these are from, um, different lakes and marine settings. Um, I, I figured though, uh, just to not scare everybody off entirely, I'd also show some x-ray images of one of the cores that I'm going to be presenting on today. This is from the Southeast Greenland shelf. Um, these are significantly less interesting to take a look at. They're mostly bioturbated mud with, um, you know, some some preserved laminations within them over over some intervals. Okay, so so we have these imperfect reporters of the Earth's magnetic field, and so we have a certain number of challenges that we have to overcome. And so I was just going to walk through a couple of these challenges and how we tried to address them in this specific study. So the, the first is that um, our knowledge of how sediments acquire their memory of the geomagnetic field is incomplete. Um, and there are likely depth dependent post depositional remnant magnetization acquisition processes um, that can account for things like time offsets and smoothing of the records. And so one approach would be to um, try to better understand that remnant, those remnant acquisition processes. Um, in, in this study, though, we, we take the approach of just trying to find 
as high resolution or as high accumulation rate sites as possible that might minimize these depth dependent um, processes. And so in this plot here, I have um, an assumption of if you just took a simple 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter offset of the magnetization relative to the deposition um, at, at a range of accumulation rates, uh, this would be the time offsets that you would you know, be accounted for. These are log log scales. Um, and so if you're working in the in the in the deep sea and pelagic environments, uh, you could have time offsets on the order of you know thousands of years. Um, the North Atlantic drip deposits that are hugely important for understanding of long-term changes and in, in um, a pit relative pillow intensity, you know, you can still have sort of millennial scale uncertainty and the timing associated with those time offsets. Um, you know, some some lake studies that I that I think about quite a bit are in this range of you know maybe centennial scale uncertainties. Um, with this study here, because we're only targeting sites that have accumulation rates at a meter per thousand years or or much much higher, um, those uncertainties um, are can actually get pretty low. And if you compare it to the uncertainties in our radiocarbon age model for this study as well as uncertainties that can be associated with reservoir effects in the ocean, both in the Pleistocene and the Holocene, um, we're sort of looking at uncertainties on the same order of magnitude. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, well, so that's our approach to deal with that challenge. There's another challenge in that the inclination declination that we recover can reflect more than just the initial depositional random magnetization or post-depositional random magnetization. This can be related to the core specimen level, um, related to say coring deformation, analytical uncertainties, um, those kind of things, or the basin level um, that are related to complexities in the depositional processes, lithologies, diagenesis, um, accumulation rate variabilities that are not resolved by the age model, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the way that we approach that at the heart of this study is really looking for uh, reproducibility in our signals, so how well we can replicate these really high resolution reconstructions. Um, and the approach that we use is um, an approach that we developed in a paper a few years ago that was led by a, a student, Cedric Kagan, um, that we called PSV Dynamic Time Warping. Um, which assembles a, a library of objective uh, correlations between uh, two vectors series like this. Um, th then you can evaluate based on uh, statistics, or um, in this case, the, the yellow shading is a depth-depth correlation between these two cores based on their independent radiocarbon data. And then the red lines are, are correlations based on this objective um, PSV correlation routine. Um, and so we can use that to assess how well the signals reproduced with respect to the age model uncertainty. Uh, and then, you know, another challenge is that that all of this depends on having strong independent chronologies, and that can be really challenging in these high accumulation rate environments. Often associated with the high accumulation rates are also um, increases in complexities in the depositional system. And so the way that we approach that here is just to get um, as many radiocarbon dates as we can. Um, our final data set uses 103 radiocarbon dates. Um, the cores, because they're located proximal to Iceland, have uh, several tephra layers within them as, as well, um, which we can compare to independently dated uh, terrestrial archives that have radiocarbon that's um, calibrated directly to the atmospheric curve as well as to ice core data that have uh, records of those volcanic eruptions. So two of the cores that we used in this compilation um, have were previously pu published by Joe Stoner back in 2007 and, and have been used um, in the literature over the years. Th these are sites uh, uh, 2269 and 2322 from the North Iceland Shelf and Southeast Greenland Shelf. Um, and the original use of these cores was to show that um, by correlation of these high resolution um, changes in inclination and declination, you can uh, refine each core's chronologies and, and get at, um, you know, a stronger constraints on the environmental change and paleoceanographic changes um, through time that these cores record. Um, there are three other cores that are that we're um, we're presenting here: two two six four, two two six five, and two two six six. 
Um, and so one of the one of the challenges with these cores is that these data have been around for a while, but um, they were awful noisy. And one of the things that we recognized was that at the time that they were run back in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, the magnetometer that they were measured on had common flux jumps on the X axis, um, which contributed to this noise between demagnetization steps. Um, and so we, we used um, some software that's available and pretty well documented at this point that, that Schwong had developed for working with U-channel samples um, to make corrections for those, those flux jumps. Um, and so here's just an example of an orthogonal projection plot of the AFD magnetization of one sample before that, uh, those flux jump corrections. Um, and this is it afterwards. And so you can see that, that you know, the data are actually look pretty good once you make that correction. Um, the, the blue data here, this is inclination versus depth, declination versus depth, and um, the MAD values versus depth. Um, the blue is before those flux jump corrections were made. You can see because it was on the x-axis, it had a really big effect on declination. Um, but just after we made those flux jump corrections, the MAD values got to values that were, are pretty low um, and what we like. And the magnetization appeared to be much better defined through time. Um, also note here, if you look at the scale of the depth, um, we're looking at 40 meters here. So um, just to show how long some of these sediment cores are compared to what we can collect with the, the modern US fleet, which is about like 15 to 20 meters or so. Um, before, before I go too much further into the data, uh, I just want to make a comment that the magnetic mineralogy that we see in these cores, we, we um, did a little bit of characterization of them. It's really similar to what we expect based on based uh, for silty clays based on um, the available data for terrestrial samples as well as other cores from the Iceland and Greenland margins that are pretty well characterized here. Um, this is a compilation that Rob Hatfield put together on this day plot. Um, the green dots here are um, are uh, data from the Southeast Greenland shelf. The blue data are from um, the North Iceland shelf. And they fall right within the ranges that we'd expect based on uh, comparison to those regional records and terrestrial records. So, so we think we have appropriate magnetic mineralogy for this. Um, here I'm just showing um, plots for three of the new cores that, that we um, included in this study. Um, here, NRM intensity, declination, inclination, MAD values, age models, and sedimentation rate. The important takeaways here is that the inclinations are uh, are all consistent with what you'd expect based on the geocentric axial dipole, plus or minus some secular variation. The MAD values are always low. This red line here is indicating five degrees, which is just an arbitrary. If it's less than that, we have a pretty well-defined magnetization. Um, so you can see that they're, they're consistently below that line. Um, these are the independent age models for each site. So they're all constrained by um, Lots of radiocarbon dates, although biased in time in their accumulation rates um, to, to different time intervals. And then here are the, uh, the accumulation rates here uh, in meters per thousand years. And so this red line here is our one meter per thousand year um, sort of cutoff, where we're only going to use data um, from intervals that were deposited at higher than that line. So that's, you know, the, the bulk of the cores, but not necessarily the bulk of the time, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so so here now is we're looking at um, these five different cores. So 2269, 2322, which had been previously published, 2266, 2265, 2264, um, inclination, declination on their independent age models. Each one of these little dots indicates where we have a radiocarbon date um, to show, give you a sense of what the dating density looks like. And where the data are in a color, um, that's one of these intervals that are deposited higher than a meter per thousand years. Um, where it's in gray, it's the intervals that were deposited less than a meter per thousand years. And so this is the last time that you'll, you'll see those data. We're not gonna consider them any further. Um, so when we compare these data on their totally independent age models, here is um, 2269 in, in blue. Um, if we, on its independent age model, bring in 2322, you can see 
Um, there's really good agreement, especially at the millennial time scale, um, as, and including some of these really high amplitude features and declination. Um, keep in mind that we're at about uh, 66 or 67 degrees north here, so, so fairly high latitudes. Um, this is 2266. Again, we're capturing high amplitude declination variability um, and good agreement at sort of the millennial time scale. Uh, 2265, which is biased towards the earliest Holocene, and then 2264, which extends back to about 15,000 years or so. Um, but we, we want to try to improve that to see if we can resolve any higher scale variability than just that comparison on the independent age models. And so, and so this is an approach that we're taking that we, we've been calling geomagnetic network analysis. I, I think some other people would, would call it some something else, but um, here's our 2269 record again on its, um, now we're looking at depth, so zero to 45 meters. This is a synthetic depth though, you'll, you'll see in a second. So this is the real depth for 2269. Um, and then we extend that record um, by bringing in uh, 2264. Um, this is the conversion from the synthetic depth scale to the depth in the core. And then for the other cores, we, we do an objective um, correlation using that dynamic time warping routine. Um, so this is then 2322. Two, two. Um, and you can see that this is this, the dynamic time warping solution here. And here's the implication for how the radiocarbon dates fit in with um, the other cores. Um, here's another core now, again, dynamic time warping solution, um, depth depth correlation, and how the radiocarbon dates fit in based on that correlation. Um, again, dynamic time warping solution for this next core, and the radiocarbon dates are added. Um, and, and so the, the, the takeaway here is that there seems to be, um, we can get correlations using this objective method that don't really violate the, um, the radiocarbon constraints. Um, are totally within that uncertainty. Um, and so potentially, you know, you can interpret that as maybe we're resolving a higher resolution signal than we could just based on the comparison of the independent, independently dated records. Um, so the next step would be to take that synthetic depth scale and create an age model for it. Um, and so um, we have... Um, so this is what an age model looks like with uncertainty. Um, it's always tied back to depth though. So if you know if you want to approach the uh, radiocarbon reservoir ages differently, if we get new calibration curves in the in the future, um, you can update that pretty easily. Um, and then this is what the declination and inclination record look like on age um, after doing this this geomagnetic network analysis. Um, one of the things to note is that in the very youngest part of the record in the last thousand years and the very oldest part of the record, um, this, this stack is only constrained by one core. And so there is an uncertainty there that we, we can't really quantify. Um, but for the majority of the Holocene interval, we have constraints from many different cores. And so we think the record's pretty robust. Um, the black here is is that record that I just showed you. Um, and this is just um, a comparison to some of the other data that exist that that go into that late deglacial time period, that, that pre-Holocene time. Um, and each record is relocated to the North Iceland shelf um, by its VGP path. Um, so that way we're we're trying to make a more direct comparison between each of the floors. Um, and so you can see that there are some broad similarities um, between all these records, um, especially at the millennial time scale. Um, so we so we think that we are getting a robust record um, that's that's consistent, you know, very broadly across um, uh, North America, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Europe. Um, just for a more detailed comparison, here are, are two different stack records from Northern Europe, um, this Finnish Lake stack, and then uh, deglacial uh, Fennel Scandia stack. Um, and so again, there's some slight differences in, in say like the timing, um, but once you relocate these Northern European data to the North Iceland shelf, 
Um, the overall record is is broadly similar, um, you know, including things like very high uh, inclination values um, around 13,000 years ago in the North Atlantic, um, as well as some of these millennial scale um, variations in inclination and declination. Um, there are differences, you know, that um, this suggests shallower inclination. Um, these records don't quite capture the full amplitude of these late Holocene declination changes that we see in the North Atlantic. Um, and that could be in a number of factors. That could be geomagnetic, that could be the nature of the records themselves, um, all, all things that could be explored. Um, so in addition to thinking about this as being um, an archive for understanding our geomagnetic history, um, this new stack record can also be used as a dating tool, um, specifically for uh, deglacial Greenland proximal sediments um, by expanding back to 15,000 years ago. Um, and so one of the examples that I'll just show you is that there's this core uh, here from the, the Southeast Greenland shelf that spans into the deglacial that Ann Jennings had worked on um, years ago that showed um, a freshwater anomaly right at the start of the Younger Dryas. Uh, super interesting observation and has implications for freshwater forests into the North Atlantic. Um, but these were the radiocarbon constraints. And so there were a whole bunch of different paths that you could take through that. Um, and when you're thinking about the timing of this freshwater event relative to um, a brief event like the Younger Dryas, um, you know, these differences can be really important if you choose, if you think the younger dates are more reliable or the older dates are more reliable. Um, when we do this, uh, apply the dynamic time warping algorithm um, to the record from this JAM 961215, um, you can see this match here where the inclinations are really steep, right? You don't really care too much about declination, but when the inclinations are shallower, declination becomes more important. So, so that all seems to work pretty well. And then we can propagate the uncertainty associated with our PSV stack into that correlation, the age uncertainty, um, to get this gray line here. And so you can see that that correlation really favors this older cluster of um, radiocarbon dates and is consistent with the interpretation of that paper. Um, we're excited about this. We went out last summer to collect a whole bunch of cores from the West Greenland margin that are gonna have similar issues of just not having a ton of material to radiocarbon date. Um, and potentially some complexities in the radiocarbon chronologies. Um, and so we imagine that, that this record will be able to help constrain some of those three glacial records as well. Um, okay, so um, going back to the, the initial motivation for this work, thinking about are we, you know, what's the full amplitude and what are the free frequency characteristics of geomagnetic change, um, specifically here in the North Atlantic? Um, I, I, I'm not going to make big claims about what this means for the geomagnetic field, but more, this is our way of assessing our record and, um, what sort of signals it contains and how reliable it might be. And so what I'm doing is I'm calculating the, the deviation from a geocentric axial dipole. So a way of bringing inclination declination to just one parameter, um, and doing a frequency analysis. And so, um, the black here is our stack record, um, and the gray, the gray value here is just using the parts of the stack record that have um, more than one core contributing to it. So just in case the intervals that just have the one core um, could affect that. You, you can see, maybe not surprisingly, um, you get more variance at, at um, these longer timescales, these millennial century timescales than at the decadal timescales. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to compare to was how that compares to the individual records that contributed to the stack. Um, and so the stack record here is 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 displaying similar variance at the timescales of sort of like the millennial timescale variability, the centennial timescale variability, but the individual records contain um, more variability at, at that decadal time at this decadal timescale here. Um, that could be related to noise in the record, or it could be something that is removed um, based on the stacking. But this is just to give you a sense of for sort of the time scale of, of variability that the stack has versus the individual records that contribute to it. Um, you can also notice that cores like 2264, which span the late deglacial time interval here, um, have more variance uh, just in general than, than say like 
um, cores that are biased more towards the middle Holocene here, because um, because it you know so that the the results might be also related to how much time you sample um, as well and and what specific time intervals you sample. Um, when we compare this to some of the Holocene field models that are out there, um, for the Holocene field models, um, we have similar variants at sort of the millennial time scale, but we have more variants at the centennial time scales. Um, if we compare to, to the GFM1 model, which, which you know, is just sampling a very short period of time, um, we have similar variants at the at these shorter time scales. I, I don't think I'd read too much into that though, just because um, you know we're sampling different time intervals. It's it's, it's difficult to know if that um, that the GFM model uh, samples a long enough time interval to really uh, assess it. You know, if we're getting that sort of time scale right in our stack. Um, and then we compare it to long period PSV, specifically uh, site 983 from the Garter Drift. And so this is one of these like 10 centimeter or so per thousand year sites um, here from close by, um, as well as local predictions from the GGF 100K model. Um, site 983, we're getting similar amounts of variance at the millennial time scale, but you know, these high resolution records are getting a lot more at shorter uh, periods, higher frequencies. Um, but but potentially, again, maybe not surprising, 983 shows um, more variance at these longer time scales. Um, again, it just might not be something that we're sampling. Um, and then and then the final point just assessing the record is that um, the amplitude in a record varies significantly over the last 15,000 years. It's not always constant. Um, this is, just plotting up BG2, BGP latitude of the stack. Um, and where the record is best constrained through the Holocene here, um, the, the deviations or the these lower BGP latitudes, um, the amplitude is a lot smaller in the mid Holocene and a lot higher amplitude in the late Holocene with the, um, the shallowest BGP latitudes occurring around 3000 years ago. Um, and so, um, that amplitude of variability is, you know, is inconsistent even at these highest resolution records through the whole Holocene, um, and it seems to be that around three thousand years ago, where where some other groups have documented particularly interesting um, local field behavior, that's that's where we're seeing the, these biggest deviations from GAD, this, this higher amplitude variability. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. looks like I'm at, at 30 minutes now. Um, but again, thanks you all for coming and thanks to the, uh, the Magnets team for organizing this. Thanks, Brendan. Um, That's what we get Brendan around the pools. Um, so at this point, I would just like to ask anyone if they have any questions um, and just raise your hand on Zoom or uh, ask a question in the chat. Uh, anyone have any questions? Right, well, to maybe just to get things started, um, I had a question. So you, you open this, oh, actually we've got one, so I'll, I'll ask that. Um, Got one from, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but Hakan Ikar. Um, but a couple of questions, it looks like. Um, first one is considering quite high sedimentation rate are these anoxic sediments? Um, and then related to the first question, do you have any interval of the cause that may have been influenced by environmental or mineralogical changes? And then third, have you transferred MAD values to alpha 95 and using which method? Maybe more of a technical one. Okay, all good questions. Yeah, so so the first one, um, considering quite high sedimentation rates of these anoxic sediments, uh, there's not really an indication of anoxia. These are in the northern North Atlantic, so it's pretty well ventilated um, on these time scales, and uh, there's plenty of evidence for biotribation in the X-rays. 
Um, so it's unlikely that they went in at any point in time. Um, there's been quite a bit of paleo environmental work, including benthic foraminiferal assemblages from some of the, especially the, the North Iceland um, shelf sites, but I think the Southeast Greenland shelves too, and there's not really an indication of anoxia from those. Um, uh, do we have any intervals, of course, that might be influenced by environmental or mineralogical changes? Um, it's I can I can show um, that those date plots again, but they're the Holocene intervals of the cores are, are pretty um, have pretty consistent mineralogy. Um, there are some differences in the deglacial intervals. Uh, where you get more turgeous material um, and, and potentially coarser turgeous material into the sites. Um, and uh, I, I only presented inclination and declination. I think relative paleo intensity is possible in, in some of these sites over certain time intervals, but but um, doing those reconstructions through, say, like the deglacial interval, I, I think is a challenge here as it is in a lot of places because of those um, environmental and mineralogical changes. And um, have you transferred MAD values to alpha 95 and using which method? Um, yeah, so so we did, we have played around with that, um, but for the stack, I'm pretty sure that the alpha 95s that we, were, we calculated were just from um, the data that was in each of the binned intervals that we um, that we chose and we weren't propagating the, the mag values. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions? Oh, Kathy Constable has her hand raised. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I also. think Tatiana was ahead of me. Oh, okay. Yes, Tatiana. Yeah, hi. I think we raised the hands at the same moment, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about lock and depth estimations. And I wonder if you have a real estimation of your lock and depth or it's just a model. And if yes, um, does this lock and depth vary uh, within the sequence or it's uh, constant? Yeah, that's those are good questions, and you know I think the the honest it answer is that we know we don't understand the lock in depths here. Um, you know we're, we were sort of thinking within a framework of in marine sediments in places where people have been able to get estimates of lock in depth. You know usually they seem to be on the order of like say five to twenty centimeters or so. Um, and so if that was the range for all marine sediments, then the higher resolution you get, the less important that becomes. Um, there is an uncertainty, you know, in not fully understanding how the magnetization is acquired that if, say, in these really high accumulation rate sediments, the lock and depth is actually much deeper, um, then that assumption might not be valid. But um, yeah, you know, we were, we were trying to circumvent the lock-in issue by um, going to only these ultra high resolution sites. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in then if Tatiana's done. Um, thanks for this nice talk, Brendan. It's a good synthesis of all this stuff. I had two questions. Um, one was related to your age model yeah. um, on that slide where you show the transition, the translation of uh, radiocarbon age to depth. And one of the things that seemed notable was that at around 10,000 years, there's a systematic um, difference between your age depth model and the actual ages. The ages all lie underneath it. Okay. Mm, uh, yeah. I was wondering if there's a, some reason for that or... Um, yeah. You know. So the age modeling routine that we use for this is this... Um, this this uh, method called undateable, um, uh -huh. and one of the one of the effects is I you know the way that it does it is is it's going to give preference to the younger cluster of age than the older cluster of age, and so um, mm. 
that that could be an issue yeah um if those younger ages aren't actually the most reliable ones i see okay so it thinks that there were young ages in that interval and wants to fit them yeah yeah it and it, it could be that um you know when you get to that level of detail that that the um the ages aren't all perfectly in line right and so that the, the mm -hmm. modeling routine is choosing the younger path and the older path um yeah. Which, which could be, yeah, that could be a source of uncertainty. And, and my other question was about um, whether there are any suitable volcanics from Iceland for comparison with your records, and if you've looked for those. Uh, it's not something that I've looked for, but you know, if you or anyone else had any ideas, um, you know, it would be a, it would be a great way to try to continue to beat down uncertainties by trying to approach it from, you know. Yeah, I mean, it might highlight the age constraints and uh, shifts in one direction or the other, which could be an interesting yeah. thing related to Tatiana's question about the lock-in depth, for example. Yeah. No, that would be that would be really useful. Yeah, yeah it might be. So Max Brown and I have been talking about trying to uh, at some point do some work on the volcanics there. So, but he's the, he's the real expert. Okay. <laughs> I don't think he's he's not on today. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be yeah. awesome. We do have um, the, especially the, the North Iceland shelf, but also the Southeast Greenland shelf is really rich in tephra layers too. Mm -hmm. um, so you could potentially make very direct comparisons if you could find um, volcanic rocks that are associated with those specific eruptions. Not being a volcanologist, I don't know how hard that would actually be to do. Yeah. But um, but yeah, and then and then um, because the like how the tephra are distributed, right? The North Iceland shelf is getting a different set of tephras than the Southeast Greenland shelf does. Um, so between the two, you know, there are potential there are potentially quite a few eruptions that you could look for specific eruptions that you could look for. And and a final question is: um, Are these data accessible in? Magic as a compilation and a separate course. Um, I they should be. Yeah. If you have, <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you have any issue accessing them, you know, just shoot me an email and I can send you okay. whatever you need. But but yeah, I, I think I got everything on all levels up to magic. That's great. Thanks. Um, there's also some data entry. I think I'm pretty sure I put it in Zenota data entries that are just like Excel workbooks too. Mm -hmm. um, that you can use if, if that's an easier format. Yeah, I think Nicole Prizzy would be interested in looking at these. Yeah, well, if there's anything that she needs that she can't find, just I'll send it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely talk. Yeah. I'd like to thank Brendan once again. Um, and uh, just before we go, I would like to just mention that our next talks are going to be on the 22nd of May, the 5th of June. Um, and then we have a lot of slots available after that. So if you want to give a talk or you know someone who is keen to give a talk, please let us know. Um, we'd love to have speakers. Um, and then just a, another little thing, which is, uh, you know, follow our channel on YouTube, um, watch any presentations that you haven't been able to catch up on. Uh, we upload everything there. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything.